I'm John Batchelor. I welcome Mark Pising, author of N4 Down. This is the story of the early part of the 20th century and the search for achievement, adventure, and conquest of the North Pole. The subtitle, The Hunt for the Arctic Airship Italia. Mark, congratulations and good evening. We go immediately to an exciting scene in your book. July 25th, 1925. We're in Norway at a house, an alpine-like house in, an, in a yeah. part of Norway that is on the uh, is on the Bunas Fjord that leads into the Oslo yeah. Fjord, and the yes. name of the alpine house is Uraniborg. Who is yeah. present at the meeting, and why is this important for Arctic exploration? Good evening, Mark. Good evening, John, and thank you very much for having me on your show. Uh, yeah, present at the meeting, with, you've got some of the main characters of the story. You've got Roald Amundsen, who is obviously the, the famous Arctic explorer, first man to the uh, South Pole, f- and led the first expedition through the Northwest Passage. You you had Umberto Nobly, who's probably less well-known, uh, who was a, a kind of a genius Italian airship designer, uh, pilot, and had aspirations, I guess you could say, to be a polar explorer. Uh, and you had Lincoln Ellsworth, who's, who some of the audience may know, kind of uh, heir to the Ellsworth fortunes. He worshipped people like Wyatt Earp. Later on in his life, he, he uh, wore apparently Wyatt Earp's wedding ring for luck. He explored the Antarctic later on, and the Antarctic transpolar flight in the early 1930s is one of the great triumphs of exploration down there. Uh and then Risa Larson, who we probably, most people won't have heard of, but he was Armisen's right-hand man. He was a very skilled pilot. He has some knowledge about how to fly uh, air, airships as well. They're meeting to plan an expedition that is proposed yeah. of an airship, not only to the North Pole, but an airship yeah. for the first time to fly over the North Pole. So why yeah. is Amundsen here? His success was at the South Pole going overland. Why does he yeah. want to fly to the North Pole? What's that? What does that mean to him, Mark? Well, I, I guess you could say it's un, unfinished. There's two things. It's unfinished business. He w- wanted to go to the North Pole but back in the kind of 1908 and 1909. Two explorers called Cook and Perry claim to have got there, so he kind of uh, had to kind of divert his interest towards the South Pole, so he never quite achieved that goal. Uh, he became fascinated by aviation, so he could see the potential for aviation as a kind of way of kind of covering the distances so much quick, more quickly and more easily than slogging it out on foot. And this is towards the end of his career as well. I mean, I, I characterise it in the book as one last big paycheck, he was kind of constantly broke, constantly bankrupt, and I th- and I think he was reckoning that, that this that this flight, along with you know all the kind of lectures afterwards, the best selling book, uh, you know, would be his kind of ticket into retirement. In other words, this is a world famous hero out of funds. Hence, Lincoln yeah. Ellsworth is present because he's financed. Now, yeah, the. Reeser Larsen is Amundsen's best friend. These are Norwegians. Yeah. They're very, very yeah. famous worldwide, but they're worshipped in Norway. Umberto Nobile, airship designer, airship director in during the war, the late, the yeah. Great War. What do we need to know about Umberto Nobile? Why does he want to go to the North Pole? Well, okay, I, mean, I, I personally, in my in my reading. Of, of him, uh, his family is, is a kind of descendant of aristocrats uh, who've kind of lost who've lost their status and lost their land, you know, in in the re- reunification of Italy. So there's a sense of I think of trying to recapture some of that glory. I mean, other people will probably disagree with me. Uh, he was a incredibly talented uh, young man. He studied uh, he studied in kind of engineering in a lot of detail. He got taken up by. Uh, Arturo Croco, who's a kind of, uh, g- another genius Italian uh, kind of engineer who, uh, who, especially in the West, I don't think we've heard much of. Uh, and he kind of got into airship building in the first war, first world war. And I guess like lots of engineers who I met writing some of my articles I've written for, for the BBC and other publications, airships seem to seduce engineers and become, and they become obsessed with them. So he, he started to build airships with Broco during the, during the First World War, became director of the kind of, 
the, the factory the Italians had to manufacture these airships at quite a young age. After the war, they carried on. They, he was one of the designers of the, of the Roma, which obviously crashed American air, uh, ship, the Americans brought off the Italians. Uh, and he was under a lot of pressure as well. I mean, in a, he was known not to be, he refused to sell his factory to kind of, uh, various kind of, I suppose speculators after the First World War. These speculators, I guess you could say, morphed into the fascists in Italy. So he was seen as being not one of us. He was seen as perhaps as being sympathetic to socialism and, and communism. So he was, all, he was also under pressure in the kind of Mussolini's Italy because, I mean, Mussolini gained power in 1920, oh, I hope I got that right, 22, 23, and in the March from Rome, and so they were now in power and he was seen as being, is he really one of us? Does he support us? Lots of people were quite jealous of him as well. So, so I think he was also looking for something that's going to protect him as well. So at, at this meeting, which is secret because they don't want attention yes. Yes. and at this meeting in which they will soon sign a contract for the purchase of N1, that's the name of the yes. Italian built airship that will become the Norway, yes. a Norwegian. They want to, they're keeping the secret, but each man at the table has a motive that isn't entirely about exploring. It's about either vindication or triumph or cash. And with Nobile, because he lives a very long time, it's every, it's every possible motive. The Mussolini <laughs> collect, connection is especially rich. What does Mussolini make of Nobile at this moment, 1925? Well, uh, 1925, Mussolini seems to be on very good terms with, uh, with Nobile. Uh, like all, fa- like the fascist movement in it, all the fascists in Italy, they kind of worship aviators, the aeronauts were the, kind of almost like the personification of fascist ideology. So he has seen, along with a number of other kind of uh, pilots, as being kind of the future of Italy. Uh, nobody could have put one-to-one meetings with Mussolini, like he could have, like he did with the Pope and the King. Uh, so he was very well thought of, other than in terms of, you know, uh, you know, you know, whose side is he really on? So this is putting together, I'm translating into the 21st century, this is putting yeah. together... SpaceX, commercial space, go to the yeah. ma- go to Mars and the Moon without yeah, the state and yeah. being wa- being worshipped for it, putting it together with political ambitions globally, global yeah. political ambitions, and a contest between Norway and Italy. Did I read that correctly, Mark? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there was a kind of a power struggle, uh, you know. In uh, I suppose this expedition, Amundsen's ambitions brought these two very different kind of cultures, very different. Well, different, I suppose, systems together and, and have almost created this clash. Yes, we're in the midst of a drama here that's about to take flight. I'm speaking yeah. to Mark Pising. Remember, this is about a tragedy that reveals the contest, the nationalism contest of the early 20th century that will turn in to the catastrophe that we remember as the Second mm. War. N4 Down is the, is the title, The Hunt for the Arctic Airship Italia. We're going to lift off next for the Arctic. 